Hello everybody and welcome to another installment of the Visual Studio Remote Office Hours. I'm your host, Mads Christensen. And uh, last week we talked to Scott Hanselman about some tips and tricks for working from home, about like personal attitude toward it, uh, some ways to set up our office, um, maybe some equipment that might be useful and so on. And uh, I've learned a lot. So I moved from my kitchen where, we did, where I did the recording last week now to the garage. So I've set up a little uh, sort of uh, recording studio out here where I can also do a little bit of work, but it will be good for video conferencing. I, I uh, went out and I went out and I bought this, it's a microphone, $50, $55. And then I uh, also above the screen, a little bit behind uh, my laptop screen here, there is a daylight lamp. So Scott Hanselman had like one of those ring lights, I think is the technical term for sort of the video recording uh, lighting lamps. Um, mine is sort of a daylight one. We live here up in the in the north, up in Seattle, and so it gets a little dark in the winter. So we happen to have one of those daylight simulating uh, lamps that I can hang off of my pegboard in my garage uh, by my workbench here. And, um, uh, and that gives me that extra lighting so that I can have a better uh, quality recording. So, um, I learned a lot from that conversation with Scott Hanselman last week and um, let me know what you think, you know, I've got some basketball going over here. I got some paper up here to like take care of the, the light coming in so that it wouldn't interfere with the white balance settings on the camera. I think I'm going to go and find a better camera to use instead of just a laptop one, but that would be for next week or whenever uh, I can go out and, and acquire one of those. Um, so today we are talking about live share and there's a specific reason why I was very interested in talking about uh, live share and why it's one of the first shows in this series. And that's because now when we are working from home, we miss that sort of collaborative nature a little bit that we had in the office uh, where you just talk to people about like, hey, can you look at this code? Or you have a question about like, hey, how did you do this thing where you made you know, this function do whatever. And live share is one way to kind of get some of that back, but it also like fundamentally fits into a workflow, whether you use uh, like a Git workflow or maybe you don't even use source control, but you have some sort of code review situation, whatever it might be, live share is gonna be very helpful when we're working from home and we're sort of a distributed team None of us sit next to each other physically. And so um, that's why I want to talk about that. And the guest that I have in the studio is uh, none other than Jonathan Carter, Mr. LiveShare himself. He is the program manager for LiveShare and other things as well, such as IntelliCode and other things. And so, um, but I think LiveShare was what really kicked things off in the collaborative space um, uh, in this wave of, of collaborative um, features that Visual Studio have got. And so let's talk about how Visual Studio through LiveShare can help us uh, uh, while we're quarantined at home. And before we begin, um, I'm actually recording this after the fact because we had a little technical difficulty such that the very beginning of the show wasn't recorded. And um, so we're gonna jump from me talking here straight into the middle of a conversation. And um, that's going to be a little bit odd, but we did go back and I made sure that we did cover all the items that we uh, talked about that didn't make it in. So we circled back and got all that uh, flushed out. So uh, all the content is there. Um, so I hope you really enjoy it. It was very fun to do. And Jonathan is a great, uh, great presenter. So enjoy. And evaluating and adopting those options takes time. And, and what we've kind of seen is that, um, you know, there's a class of people that have been interested in checking out live share, but maybe didn't have an immediate need for it, or um, they, you know, we're still trying to roll it out across the team because live share works best when the whole team is using it, much like really any collaboration tool. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's been it's been very satisfying to be in a position where we had kind of a service that was able to accommodate 
folks having a sudden need to reassess, hey, how could we begin to work in a world now where we're all remote um, for teams that maybe were not before? Um, and so, so yeah, we've seen a lot of a lot of um, teams that maybe didn't even do pair programming before, but are now starting to do it because they're realizing that like they're they want to explore with ways to keep cohesion amongst themselves or um, encourage more collaboration that might have otherwise happened organically in the office. Um, a lot of code reviews happening over live share um, now that a lot of teams are doing all of their interviews remotely. Um, LiveShare also happens to be quite applicable for technical interviews, especially if the interview process itself is kind of fundamentally a collaboration session between two developers. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been very, uh, like I mentioned, satisfying to kind of work with a, a much larger influx of developers who are using it continuing to see the the vast use cases that people are doing getting more feedback um you know and we've been trying to kind of up our release cadence as well to kind of like get bug fixes or release kind of really high price feedback quicker um because of the heightened um value and need that it brings kind of right, right now so <clears throat> that's very cool so yeah. i think we've had some actually some technical problems i was like following twitter and uh, a lot of people had a difficulty uh connecting um i just heard that they are able to connect now so i think we probably just had a few people on and the, a lot of people couldn't connect but they should be able to connect now so um, okay so that's uh, you okay at yeah, first, so, I thought you were talking about technical difficulties with live share. I was like, okay, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, no, it's all good. So, um, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see people come into to the live stream here now. They're able to. Um, um, I guess one thing that um, is kind of interesting about live share is the now that we have this connection that connects two, let's just say two computers, right? It could be a Mac running VS Code connected to a Windows machine running Visual Studio IDE, right. and they can now share the session between them and, and, and be productive and all that sort of stuff. And when working from home, I found that one of the things that I miss when I'm like writing code is that I can like talk to others and like, hey, how did how did how was how did you do that? Or mm -hmm. I have an issue with this particular thing. Um, you know, things that normally would take like 30 seconds. Like it would just be a, a lean back and you know yell to the person sitting behind me, like, how did you do that again? You, I remember you doing something like this. What was that? Mm -hmm. uh, so with live share now that we have the ability to not just share the screen, but we can do more now, right? We can also we can also chat. There's some there's some audio. There's a, a, a communication channel built in. Is that right? That is true. Yeah. In fact, um, live share right now in in Visual Studio. Um, we have the notion of insiders channel, much like Visual Studio itself has. And so if you opt into that, then one of the capabilities that you get is integrated voice chat. Um, and uh, when we first released LiveShare, we were quite opinionated about not replacing or trying to become kind of the uber collaboration solution for developers, particularly because people already use Teams, Slack, Discord, right? A million of these different things. But what we found over time is much like you said, if if really what you're looking to do is collaborate with someone on code, then there is really no way to not have communication be a part of that experience as well. And so even though you could use a separate tool like Teams to, or, or Slack to, to talk on the side of a live share session, there is, we found a ton of value in being able to use a single tool and a single kind of URL to say, hey, Madge, join into this. Um, and so behind the scenes, what's kind of cool is that um, live shares audio chat is actually using the same infrastructure that Teams uses. Um, and so we were able to collaborate <laughs> uh, 
uh, collaboration, two collaboration tools are able to collaborate to add a better collaboration experience to a collaboration tool. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> and because of the fact that it's built on that shared infrastructure, then in Visual Studio, like you said, you can be hosting a live share session and start up a audio call. I could then join that from Visual Studio code on Linux, and I can join not only the same real-time coding and debugging session, but also the same audio call. Um, even though neither of us had to install or sign into any additional services in order to support that, like we literally just got the link from you, joined, and now my editor is entirely connected to yours with, with chat and everything. Um, this so this sounds excited. like magic. Like there's something here that doesn't sound right. This is like, um, I don't know what type of tech you got there, but there's like, okay, let's say I'm on Windows in Visual Studio writing um, Windows Forms a desktop app, right? Mm -hmm. Old school, like .NET Framework 4.5 WinForms app. And I'm now connected and I now share a live screen, uh, sorry, a live share session with you on VS Code on Linux. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned debug. Debug requires that I run the app. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you on a Linux box can run my Windows Forms desktop app. Uh, so how would, right? I mean, how would that work? How would that work? Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because another, another benefit of us collaborating with the Teams team on the rich capabilities they already have is that in addition to us having integrated audio in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, we also have integrated what we call app casting. Um, and so what happens is that if you're in that WinForms application in Visual Studio, when you hit F5, within a live share session, we detect that you launched a desktop window and we automatically app cast that window to all guests. And so even though I might be in VS Code on Linux, where I could not run a WinForms application, I would then automatically see a window pop up on my screen that is that WinForms app um, and not just see it, but I could interact with it. And even further, I could set a breakpoint in the code, click a button, and if that button triggered the handler that that breakpoint was set in, we would then both be paused at the breakpoint and could step and inspect watches um, on the exact same debugging session. Um, and, and like you said, it is quite magical, um, but the, in many ways, the, the simplicity of live share is just that, you know, when you look at IDEs and editors and kind of decompose them into a series of primitives, so to speak, there's, there's much more that's shared between them that is not OS or tool specific that allows live share to understand the concept of a debugging session, which has one or more breakpoints, which can be currently paused or not. If you are paused, there's a stack, right? There is a series of locals. Um, there is the notion of stepping the debugger forward. Um, and, and so those concepts, Live Share understands at a kind of editor or OS agnostic level and then can translate them between not only one or more parties, but also people working in different tools. And so that's how you're debugging in Visual Studio. I'm in Visual Studio Code and it looks and feels totally natural because Live Share is handling the translation between those common um, concepts or state or gestures. Um, and so the case of the, the screen sharing is we kind of introduced another primitive into the editor or the IDE that could be collaborated on in a way that is cross-platform, which in this case is um, sharing the pixels of the window um, to all participants um, that way. One of the benefits of that is that, you know, if you're working on that WinForms app and you need my help, you don't know whether I'm going to join your session from Windows and VS or VS Code on Linux. And so what's really important for you is that I can help you regardless what context that I'm in. And so that's kind of one of the 
the big responsibilities that LiveShare tries to, to help uphold is make sure that, you know, all participants in a session can get the same context regardless what their client or OS is. So can you also from the Linux side interact with that app mm -hmm. that uh, comes up there? How do you can? How do you, how does how that do you work? do that? Yeah. Uh, it's, so the window that's actually getting popped up is an Electron app. Um, and as you might imagine, it simply has uh, hooks in place that are looking for mouse keyboard gestures and then proxying those back to the host. And so when you click a button on the Linux guest side, it's saying, oh, you know, mouse click on this pixel position which gets routed back to the host, that gesture gets played, and then the effects of that gesture gets rendered back as a pixel update to the to the guest. Um, and so there is an element that's kind of funny about that, right? Where, as I mentioned before, uh, live share, we're trying to share context, not screen. Um, and so, you know, some people's first reaction is, well, then why would you be supporting sharing pixels in the case of an app cast? Um, but the reality is, is that we we can only kind of deconstruct the state of certain things and share it. So like I mentioned with debugging, you can actually represent a debugging session as well as the actions you can take on it in a very uh, editor agnostic or, or screen agnostic way, right? Like breakpoints, locals, watches. Whereas if you're debugging a WinForms app, there's no way for us to like turn the UI of that application into some uh, UI agnostic state that we can just uh, you know proxy back and forth. Um, and so what the guest has to do is it is like you're interacting with a little window specific screen share um, uh, that is fully interactable, um, which is pretty cool. Okay, so when I said it was magic, now I think it's really magic. <laughs> so, okay, so, so you're basically bridging the gap, right, between OSs and clients and all this sort of stuff, which is yeah. that's that's phenomenal. And um, and the whole app app sharing is that's that's just crazy that you can interact from other OSs. Right? That's mm -hmm. well done, sir. <laughs> um, Thank you. So when like. For things that people do when they're in the office, like um, let's say a code review, right? We we a lot of times we sit together to do a code review together. We have, you know, um, it's so in my team that's very typical that we do that. That's just part of our workflow that we sit together to go through things. Um, now in this new world, that's not really possible. So live share comes in there. How do you see like the code review specifically? Um, changing and how how live share kind of helps with that um yeah i mean <clears throat> you know one thing we didn't touch on specifically but you know live share is obviously very focused on real-time synchronous collaboration um and and really what we've seen is that it can represent a nice complement to existing asynchronous collaboration workflows teams already have um, and, and with code reviews in particular, we've seen two kind of common things. One is either, let's say you're, you've completed a, a task or um, you know, a user story or a bug, and you're, a, you're about to prepare to send a pull request to kind of socialize that change with the whole team, but you'd like to get kind of a quick sanity check or, or you wanna get you know, a second pair of eyes on it before you do that, just to kind of see if you can't spot any, you know, um, common pieces of advice. And so we see a lot of folks that use live share um, for that, which we kind of call the desk check or an informal code review. Um, and so I might say, hey, Mads, can you join in my session? And so one of the things that's pretty cool about live share is it supports the ability for you and I to either focus on the same thing or focus on independent things. And so, for example, when you join a live share session at first, you're following the host's cursor. And so in terms of code reviews, I could 
start up a live share session, invite you into it. We could have an audio call as well. And I could walk you through kind of the narrative of the change I made and have a really rich kind of guided code review conversation. Um, but we're both in our own personalized environment, right? And so you could be in VS Code, I could be in Visual Studio. Um, and as I'm scrolling through and saying, yeah, this is where I changed this part. And then I scroll down to the bottom and I refactored this code. You're following along with me. And so you're able to see and interact. But where this gets really interesting is let's say you have a question about the code that I'm showing you. You can start to do subtle things to interact with it. So you, you hover over a method name and you see the, the IntelliSense description for that, right? Because you're not just passively watching me explain my code. You actually are able to interact with this code as if it's local, as if it's live. Um, or maybe you see that I refactored a method and you want to know, oh, does that change break any callers of that method? You just right click and say, find all references. And you can immediately start to answer questions to get you comfortable with knowing that the change I made is, is actually good. Um, and so we've seen that that workflow can work really well. Then let's say you say, yeah, this looks great. I send out a pull request, but I can kind of mention, you know, already kind of worked with Mads. You know, this PR is more for kind of the broader team. The other scenario that we've seen is we all know that it can sometimes be possible that you send out a pull request and it kind of just sits there for a while. Um, and everybody, I don't know anybody that enjoys a pull request that is not getting merged, right? It's like every second that a PR is not merged, you know, uh, something terrible happens in the world, right? And so uh, what we've seen uh, is that Live share can kind of represent a way to not accelerate, but if you have a PR that's out and you're realizing that the code itself is not um, like you want to help foster a, um, a conversation about the change that can help make it easier for people to understand it, then what we've seen is people can then do a live share session about the PR change and then help walk reviewers through what they did, similar to what I just mentioned in kind of the informal code review. Um, and then that makes it actually easier for people to kind of say, oh, okay, I understand what you're doing. Um, and and so that actually we've seen in some cases can help accelerate the, the velocity of getting PRs merged in, um, which then is just goodness for not only the team, but also the product. Um, and so, uh, so that's generally kind of what we've seen in that, in that those use cases are some of the more common that we see with live share. Um, because as you mentioned, particularly for remote teams, you're kind of just doing virtually what you would do otherwise in person where you might sit down next to somebody and say, hey Mads, can you please just come review this PR with me? Let me walk you through it. Um, or we see some people that even print off code and they will look at it and kind of trace, you know, okay, you did this, you did this. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're quite passionate about helping to enable the kind of natural interactions that people want to do, but do it in a way where you don't have to be physically co-located um, in order to do it. Okay, <clears throat> so it sounds like whether I have like a Git workflow like commits and pull requests and that sort of stuff or you know some people have a different workflow where they might just do a code review and then they commit together from that from the developer's machine mm -hmm. it seems like live share is going to be helpful for like all those workflows like it's it can scale up to sort of the most complex uh, pull request with bots integration <laughs> all sorts of stuff like it will it will help you along the way no matter where you are in, in your company in your workflow that is exactly right. Yeah, we kind of like as a goal, we want live share to be a complement to the existing workflow that your team already has. Um, we don't want you to have to change anything about the way you work in order to improve collaboration. And so we see teams where they do all trunk based development um, and by trunk based, 
you know, we just mean that they don't create branches. They just push commits straight to master. Um, and to some people, that sounds like chaos. But for many teams, it works wonderful. Um, and one way that they they get around potential um, merge conflicts or that they address keeping the knowledge sufficiently transferred across the team is they do code reviews in real time or they do pair programming such that the right people knew about the changes before it was actually pushed um, into master. Um, or if you want to use branches and then do kind of um, you know, code reviews before you send out a PR or you want to use PRs or you, you know, want to really anywhere in between, um, live share can actually work well. And actually, even more than that, you don't even need the project you're working on to be version controlled at all. Um, now, you probably should do that, right? But like what we also see a lot of is, let's say um, you're at a hackathon. We see a lot of people using live share for bootstrapping a new project and then working together as a group even before they've created let's say a github repo and pushed anything yet um and so live shares uh really has not much opinion in terms of how are you persisting the code long term and then how are you asynchronously collaborating uh by means of git um, it, it really kind of wants to be the real-time layer on top of files that are stored and managed however you your team decides is the best thing for them. Cool. One thing I just um, that just dawned on me is um, you know if if someone starts a live share session and someone else joins and that someone else has a different set of extensions or a different set of settings that will work in a live share session. Let's say it's a linter. Or JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So the host themselves say, hey, can you please look at this before I commit the uh, or I send the PR, right? Um, now the guest comes in with a different set of linters and extensions, and they will now see squiggles, right? They will actually see my linter on my side says that there's something here that uh, you could improve on, mm -hmm. and that the original host had no idea because they didn't have the same extensions. And typically, like in a junior, senior, mm -hmm. or mentor role or whatever, there might be like just things that the, the new junior or whatever developer doesn't know, like doesn't know that there are some cool settings that enable something or some extensions that allow for something. And and now this, uh, this you know, the code reviewer comes in and, and is able to find things that otherwise uh, wouldn't have been found or would have been found at at the actual code review to, to accept the PR. And then there would have been a lot of work for the uh, junior kind of to, to do, right? And so there is that sort of, um, I, but what, that was my thinking. Is mm -hmm. that actually true? Uh, it is actually true. And so, you know, I think uh, the example you just mentioned, we find there to be a lot of value. You could then also ask, oh, well, if the guest that joins has an additional linter, does that linting results get bidirectionally shared back with the host so that everybody sees kind of the intersection of insights that all parties get through extensions um, and and we don't currently do that right and so really there's there's kind of two key things that live share tries to uphold today one is all of the extensions and the support tooling support that the host has the guest receives that and then the second is that any additional extensions or settings or personalizations that the guest have they continue to receive those on top of what the host has in order to prevent it from feeling foreign, right? Because like, let's say you have an extension that you're so used to using and you just suddenly didn't have it because you're collaborating, you would notice it. Um, and then down the road, you could imagine that we then somehow compose all of the extensions that all the parties in the live share session have so that everybody has the same exact thing um, we have not done that yet because, as you might imagine, it's uh, challenging to get right from a experience perspective because for us to know that, like, well, maybe I don't want to see your linters that you've got because it's something that is total noise to me. Um, and so there's an element of kind of stepping into what we share by default in order to make things, you know, immediately productive 
visually ergonomic for you, but not kind of noisy or distracting for me. Um, and so. That, yeah, that makes sense. Also, I could imagine that uh, just extensions alone, especially for Visual Studio, maybe maybe to a lesser degree Visual Studio Code, but Visual Studio at least, like installing an extension, you have to kind of restart VS, and there's a right. lot of sort yeah. of requirements for for extensions to kind of come live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so earlier you mentioned something that I found quite interesting. You said that you could have a one-to-one, -one, like a guest can join a host, but you also said that up to 30 guests can join the host. Now that to me sounds sort of like a classroom or brown bag sessions. Let's say at work, we, you know, for lunch, we can call for a meeting to the team, say, hey, come bring your lunch. I'm going to show you something. Um, and now in this day and age where that means that we all sit separately at home, we can actually maybe join instead of a video stream, a more interactive flow here or a sort of a classroom type um, thing. Is that something you are looking at or have heard from other people that they find interesting or? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think as we talked about the code review scenario and um, we kind of hinted at the, the magic moment of that where you're using live share is the fact that you as the reviewer aren't just following along with me, but you're actually able to also interact with the code yourself, right? Hovering over a, a method, doing a find all references. If you needed to edit something to show me, you could. Um, what we found is that there are all these forms of collaboration that um, benefit from increased interactivity. Right. And so, as you mentioned, brown bags is a scenario that we didn't necessarily start out to try to solve. But what we found organically is that people started using live share for doing brown bags because it would allow me to walk the team through a change or, you know, I want to help onboard everyone to this new area of the application so that we can all work on it together versus, you know, having single ownership. And instead of me just projecting code onto a screen, the fact that folks are able to be in the code base with me from their environment and interact as needed, um, we found that it, it actually can help increase engagement. Um, and so then you say, okay, cool, a, a brown bag with a team, um, that's really not that different than a classroom lecture. Um, where now you maybe have a group of students listening to a course um, and once again instead of just kind of looking at a projector um, or staring at code they're able to follow along but also interact and and participate on an as needed basis and so we see this happen in classrooms where you know the teacher can can maybe say hey Mads um, why don't you, you know, what would you do with the code here on line 12? And then all of a sudden you go and you can start typing and everyone in this session is able to see it. Um, and those subtle, those subtle opportunities for everyone who's collaborating to not feel like just a passive observer, um, we've found goes a long way in making the experience more enjoyable. Um, and so, in, you know, some ways when we talk about live share, it's a little altruistic, but we we talk about like we don't want to just boost productivity and you know efficiency and velocity and symmetry and all these other buzz terms, but also like how could we make collaboration just feel better and, and make it more enjoyable for you so that you're more likely to want to do it, um, and as a result, the team and the product is going to just benefit. Um, and so uh, so. That's a very long winded explanation to your question of yes, we see that happen. And the reason that we've seen it is that even in cases where you have uh, three to five, maybe up to 20 people, there's still a ton of value um, in, in being able to kind of collaborate like that. And so besides brown bags and classrooms like lectures, we also see um, some folks do what's called mob programming. Um, which if, if folks haven't heard that term before, is basically pair programming with more than two people. Um, and uh, and then there's another thing called swarming, which is basically like a temporary. Well, hang on. Sorry, go ahead. Hang on. 
mod programming, you are pair programming with multiple. That sounds like that sounds like a potential uh, war zone or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny with live share. Um, when we first designed LiveShare, there was a couple of critical design points that, that um, were contentious that, so for example, if I start a debugging session in a LiveShare session and there's you and there, me, 10 other people, um, any of us can step the debugger forward if we want. There is no needing to request permission to do that. Um, and the reason that we did that is because we kind of, had this hypothesis that in most cases teams already had kind of an interaction or a a social uh understanding amongst themselves to control the chaos um and and we wanted the tool to allow you to naturally uh perform those interactions that you would otherwise do um over time, we have found that there was value in us giving the host more control to control the chaos. Um, but surprisingly, you know, a lot of teams that have culturally embraced doing mob programming, um, generally what happens is each person in the session has a role during some period of time. And so it isn't just a bunch of uh, developers smashing on the keyboard, which would likely have some interesting side effects. Um, you know, you might have someone who's, hey, Mads, you go implement uh, the unit tests for the feature I'm going to go uh, create. Um, and then someone else is going to, let's say we're working on a web application. We see this where you go do the CSS, I'll go do the JavaScript. Um, and then there's four of us that are divide and conquering um, and uh, able to collaborate in a way that you actually could not with screen sharing, because with screen sharing, even if you have multiple cursors, you're still focusing on the exact same thing. Whereas with live share, um, you can actually work on fully independent files or locations in a file, even though the changes that you're all making are being synchronized amongst the group. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's interesting. So that means that I can have a feature that my whole team, we're working on uh, the same project in Visual Studio. We're working on independent things. And we may not even use Git. We don't share the source code. The source code only exists on the host's machine. And, and then afterwards, we can like do the code review and see if everyone is happy and then just commit. And there's there's no other artifacts on the guests' machines from that project at all. They don't even need to have the runtime components to, let's right. say, need the uh, .NET Core 3.1. Like they don't actually need to have that in order to edit CSS for one person, and the other another one does C# -sharp or whatever. Is that yep. is that correct? That is totally correct. In fact, some of the demos that I love to do is like, you know, you're you're on a Mac doing like Rust development and you've got 15 extensions so your editor's tricked out, you invite me into a live share session and I'm getting IntelliSense and debugging and using your terminal and stepping through as if I've installed everything needed for that to work, but I haven't had to do anything because you as the live share host, you're powering all of the tooling and runtime environment for all participants in the session, which right. is kind of a big part of what makes the flexibility of live share possible. Yeah, I mean, it does sound very uh, magical, I'd say. I, I would like to just say something to the audience because we have um, six minutes left here. Um, if you have any questions, now would be the right time. There's a Q&A panel. Um, you might be able to see that. And so feel free to ask any questions to uh, Jonathan about Visual Studio, live share, or Visual Studio in general. Or working from home, or whatever you might uh, feel like asking. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I guess I can start with a question then. Here, Q and A time. <laughs> when a guest or multiple guests connect to a host, does that happen through a server, or is that direct peer-to-peer? -peer, my computer, my internet connection, straight to yours. How does that connection work? 
That is a good question. Um, so by default, when a guest joins a live share session, we attempt to connect them via a peer to peer connection, so directly. Um, uh, and, and the reasons for that are because it's obviously faster and we want to optimize the kind of network latency as much as we possibly can. That said, as we all know, uh, the internet is a very complex beast, uh, complete with firewalls and you know network translators and caches. And so, if there is not, if it's not possible for us to connect two participants together directly, we then spin up a cloud relay that is then used to proxy communication between those two participants. Um, and but even in the latter case, the I mentioned earlier that we have a end-to-end -end encrypted SSH connection. Um, this is very important. This is a common question we get. The that same end-to-end -end encrypted channel is leveraged in either case, whether LiveShare is able to use a direct connection peer-to-peer -peer, or it has to use the relay because we cannot create a connection. Um, and that's beneficial because then none of your code or any of the communication that you do with your peers is ever visible to anything on the internet, never stored on any server. Um, it is all 100% um, ephemeral and secure to you and your peers. Um, so. All right. Well, that's good to know. So we got a question here from Jonas. He asks, uh, do you find yourself more productive working from home? What do you think, Jonathan? Um, I would say yes and no. I mean, I I personally, and this is my own just behavior, but I am a very social person. And so I find that if I'm in a team room with people, uh, there is a high likelihood that I like to engage in conversation ad hoc a lot. Um, and so certainly working from home uh suppresses some of that natural behavior um and so uh you know uh that said i have not been working from home uh before uh this current situation and so my kids who are now out of school have not really gotten used to knowing that dad is working and <laughs> and so that's that they offset maybe some of the productivity that i gain in other ways and so it's probably you know some days are more productive than others but but yeah so far so good i i need to get more tips from mads and and, Han and scott handelman to to keep my productivity boosts going yeah i will uh i'll make sure to mention the link here uh, when we finish here i want to be respectful of your time jonathan and we got like two minutes left i just want to i want to just i have two questions okay to end, to end this with uh one is like to use LiveShare, do I need an Azure subscription? How how do you bill me? Like how much do, does this cost? Um, that that's what I would like to know. And the other one is how do I get that insiders uh, preview release of LiveShare to get that audio support? Yeah. Um, so LiveShare is a hundred percent free, um, and so you do not need anything other than a Microsoft or GitHub identity. Um, and so if you install Visual Studio 2019 or the LiveShare extension for VS Code, um, you will sign in with GitHub or a Microsoft account. And the reason for that is because in any collaboration experience, there's obviously a ton of value in people knowing that you are in fact who you say you are. Um, and so I wouldn't want to be collaborating with somebody who claims to be Mads but it's actually uh, some Bitcoin miner trying to use my machine to uh, do that. Um, but there is no need for Azure and there is no billing at, at all. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> your, what was your second question, Mads? I'm sorry. <laughs> I got lost in tangent there for a second. How do you get the insiders uh, oh, oh. build? Yes, um, so if you go to tools options and you look for the live share section, there is a setting uh, called feature set that by default is set to stable. You just toggle it to insiders. Um, and we actually have a link um, I can maybe paste into the chat or whatever would be the best way to persist this. 
which is aka.ms slash VSLS hyphen insiders. Um, and that has um, not only instructions on how to enable insiders, but also at any given point, what features are available in the insiders channel. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It is exactly 10 o'clock. We are now an hour later. Um, this was very helpful. I learned a lot. Uh, live share um, is kind of demystified for me now. So thank you so much for uh, for helping me out with that. Awesome. Um, we have a we now have a YouTube playlist where we put all these shows, and so you can find them all there. This is the second show we're doing in the in the Re Visual Studio Office Hours series. But if you go to aka.ms/slash VS office hours, you will be able to find them in the future. So next week we're going to do this again and we're going to do this Thursday. So instead of Friday, we're going to do it Thursday, but still the same time, 9 a.m. in the morning here, uh, Pacific time. So same time, but Thursday. And we're going to talk about some really cool benefits that you probably didn't know that you had with your Visual Studio subscription and how to take advantage of it and um, I think uh, that will be highly interesting. And so we're going to talk to uh, Katie about that uh, next week. So, but for now, thank you so much for joining everybody uh, live or for you who has watched uh, on demand on YouTube. Until next week, thank you. Thank you.